I do want to bring a message to you today that, that God laid on my heart some weeks ago, and, um, and I, think, I think it's going to touch you deeply. I know it, it's, it's ministered to me as I've studied it out and, and kind, of, kind of worked through it. Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15. If you don't, you can follow along on the screens. Uh, we'll have, have everything up there for you this morning. But the title of this message is, is just simply, But in Fact. But in Fact. Uh, and, uh, and that'll make sense at the conclusion. It may not make any right now, but it will at the end of this. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12, down through verse 20 says, But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. It's real uplifting so far, isn't it? <clears throat> in that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Father, I just pray that you would bless the remainder of this service uh, today, God, and touch each life that's here. Bless the reading of your word to our lives and our hearts. May it change us from the inside out. And we give you praise now in Jesus' name. And we all said amen. Now, begin with this statement. Everything in Christianity hinges on this one truth, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If you take, if you take everything else and discard it, but this truth remains, then Christianity is intact. But if you take this away from Christianity, then Christianity is useless. It really is. It's the reason that we worship God on Sundays instead of Saturdays. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the very reason why uh, back in the days of Christ, in the early part of the first century, after the resurrection Sunday, when Jesus was raised from the dead, people began to worship on Sunday instead of on Saturday. Now, many of the Jews of that day, they would worship on Saturday as well, but they would come back, but they would worship in their small home groups on Sunday. So it changed the entire complexion of religion as the world knew it. Jesus died on a cross. He died on Friday. He was in a tomb on Friday. He stayed there till Sunday morning. On Sunday, he was raised from the dead. And this is the single most important truth in Christianity. All the other claims can be claimed by other religions, including the virgin birth. Now, it, it, we know that there's only been one of those, but people have tried to claim that. But no one has ever claimed the resurrection of their, their religious leader from the dead. Now, what we will see at the end time, if you are familiar with Revelation, you will know that there will be a counterfeit that comes that claims to do the same thing. But up until this point, this is the single most important truth in Christianity. People have been discussing this. They have been trying to discount this since the very beginning. Even some of our, even some of our leaders, our, our found, the founding fathers of this nation, Thomas Jefferson, our third president, had a profound appreciation of the teachings of Jesus Christ. But Thomas Jefferson was also a child of the Enlightenment. And when he was 16, year old, 16 years old as a first-year student at the College of William and Mary, Professor William Small now introduced him to the writings of John Locke and Sir Francis Bacon. And, and their enlightened brethren enthroned reason uh, concept and they made logic lord and Jefferson did the exact same thing. In 1804, February of 1804, Thomas Jefferson took out his razor, his straight razor <clears throat> and he took his favorite passages out of the Bible. He cut every one of them out of scripture and he pasted it in double columns on 46 uh, octavo sheets and it's called the Jefferson Bible to this day. It included the teachings of Jesus Christ because he really had a, a, a very deep appreciation for the teachings of Christ. But the difference is this, that Jefferson cut out all the miracles with his razor. He cut them, literally cut out the pieces that he wanted and left the miracles alone. And, and so what he did was this. He took care of every single miracle from the virgin birth to the resurrection. He deleted every supernatural event, every miracle in between. The moral lessons survived, but the miracles didn't. Jefferson's Bible ends with the stone being rolled over the tomb. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus went in the tomb. But according to Thomas Jefferson, he never was resurrected from the dead. 
Now, there are a lot of people today that, that, that look to our founding fathers as, as, as good Christian brothers and that they had all these Christian teachings and all this kind of stuff. And the, and the truth of the matter was some may have, but more of them were deists than they were actual Christians. They believed in the teachings of Jesus Christ. They believed in the moral teachings, but they discounted the miraculous side of, of, of Christianity. And so I would just say to you, those that, that really try to get on the bandwagon of, of returning to the teachings of our founding fathers, you might want to be a little careful about that. You know, I don't think we need to return to the teachings of our founding fathers in this nation. I believe we need to turn, return to the Bible and the God of the Bible. Okay? This is not a political message, and that's the only political service announcement I'm going to make this morning. But if Thomas Jefferson Bible is correct and, and the resurrection didn't happen, then what I'm doing this morning is useless. What I've been doing for a living for the last 34 years is actually useless, and that's being a preacher. The fact that we claim to have faith in, in God is a useless endeavor if, if Thomas Jefferson is right. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ didn't happen, then our preaching is useless, our faith is useless, all of the apostles uh, in the Bible have lied about God. You and I are still guilty of all of our sins from the very beginning of our life to this present point. Everyone who has died in the past just died, and they died lost. And in truth, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ did not happen, then Christians are to be pitied more than any group of individuals in the entire world. Because we've been believing in something that has no water. It, just doesn't, it doesn't hold water at all. Isn't that, a great, isn't that a great Easter message? That you come to church on, on Easter Sunday in 2016 and realize that if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is taken out of the picture, then we are to be pitied more than anything, anything else in this world. That we're still lost in our sins. That the Bible isn't true. The apostles are liars. And our faith is useless. So let's take a look at the historical side of things. If you've been paying any attention on television this week, then you've seen, you've seen the History Channel and all, uh, everything. Uh, the Passion has been on. The New Passion has been on. The Passion of Christ has been on. All of these things have been on TV. History Channel has had all kind of documentaries, and I've watched two or three of them this week just, just to kind of see what their take on a lot of things are. And I've, been, I've been kind of surprised at some of it, uh, the, the positive spin that they put on some things which is kind of unusual for the History Channel uh, when it comes to Christianity anyway. But let's talk about the historical side of everything that went on with Jesus. Do you know that the death of Jesus Christ and the evidence for his death is greater than that for almost every other event in the ancient world? There's more evidence, more evidence for the death of Jesus Christ in the ancient world than any other event that ever took place. The nature of his wounds, from the whipping, the crucifixion, the spear in his side, the crown of thorns on his head, his mother, his friends, his closest disciples, they all witnessed his passing. The Romans, who were expert executioners, and I watched the documentary this week about the Roman, ex the Roman crucifixion, which is what happened to Jesus. And they were talking about the, the horrific side of that and, and actually some of the archaeological evidence that they have for it that has just been uncovered in the last, maybe the last 10 years. They actually have a bone now, a leg bone, an ankle bone, with a nail that is driven in it. And they were showing that the other, uh, the, the other evening on, on, the, on the documentary I was watching. But the Romans were expert executioners. They all declared him dead. Pilate, the Roman governor, actually double-checked to make sure he was dead. The Jews never disputed that Jesus' body was buried in the tomb of Sanhedrin member Joseph of Arimathea. Non-Christian writers in the 1st and 2nd century, Josephus, Tacitus, Thallus, Lucian, Felgon, and the Jewish Talmud all recorded the, the death of Jesus Christ. Even modern, modern medical authorities, the Journal of the American Medical Association, they've examined the evidence and they've verified that Jesus did die on a cross. Additionally, early church fathers, Polycarp and Ignatius, confirmed that Jesus did, in fact, die on a cross. There's no argument there. History doesn't argue with the fact that Jesus died on the cross, that he, that he went into a tomb. But the question we have to ask this morning on this Easter Sunday is this. Is there proof of the resurrection? Is there proof of the resurrection? There are a number of theories. 
that go right back to the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Especially the one where, where the, the, the Jewish religious leader started the rumor that, that the disciples had come and stolen his body. And they had hid it somewhere. The problem, the problem was that it was, an, it was an accusation of the Jewish religious leaders of the day. It was never investigated and, and it was certainly not proven. And it was the actual Jewish uh, religious leaders that actually started that rumor. But the one that's had the most traction for almost 2,000 years, especially in the last few hundred years, and especially, especially in the last hundred years in our country, is called the swoon theory. How many of you are familiar with the swoon theory? Anybody? All right. Cole over there with the apologetics going on. The swoon theory it goes this way, and this is the one that's gained the most traction over the last five decades. That when he was on the cross, that he didn't really die. He just fainted from the excruciating pain and blood loss. And they took him off the cross, and they put him in a tomb. And because of the coolness of the tomb and the darkness of the tomb, and having rested for three days or thereabouts, he revived and felt strong enough to roll the stone away and walk out. I'm telling you, this is, this is, this is the, the pre preeminent um, argument for discounting the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the scientific world today. That he didn't really die, he just went. Now, now, here's some problems with that. Jesus was wrapped in grave clothes. And if you've ever seen a mummy or a, the, a, a picture or a film or a movie of the mummy, you know that a mummy is wrapped from head to toe. That's, those are the grave clothes. But the Jewish um, burial ritual is different than just wrapping them in grave clothes. Because when, before, when they get put on the, in a tomb, they're wrapped in the grave clothes, they're wrapped head, head to toe. They're covered in about 100 pounds of stuff. All kind of, of, of uh, spices and herbs and, and all kind of stuff that they, that, they, that they put on. It weighs over 100 pounds. And then it was, his tomb was sealed and it was guarded by a Roman guard. Now, if you take what we know of Jewish burials, which we know this to be true, Jesus would have been buried in this fashion. There's no argument that he died. There's no argument that he was in a tomb. He was placed in that tomb with 100 pounds of stuff piled on top of him, including the grave clothes. And the, the, the stone was rolled over. The, the guards placed there. They were double-checked to make sure they were there. They were charged with, if you fall asleep on your watch, you're going to die. So let's take all of that into consideration. If Jesus just swooned, if he just fainted, he would have had to somehow unwrap himself, get the 100 pounds of junk off of him, pull the stone back. I think it's fair to say that if he did that and walked out, that he would scare the Roman soldiers because of the way he looked. Because he would have looked more like a zombie horror flick than he would a victorious, triumphant Savior over death. Because he was beaten was something like this. I don't know if we can get a close-up on this, but this is, this is a Roman scourge. This is archaeologically correct from the time period of Jesus Christ. As you can see, it's made of leather lashes, and it's got lead. They would also weave bone and pottery pieces in these things too. And so if you, if you take, and I'm going to ask Chris Dykes to come up here, and we're going to demonstrate I want to see how long Chris can handle this. But 39 times, Roman soldiers hit him with this. And if you watched any of the documentaries this week, and if you've ever read the, the article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, they give you a, a, a very explicit description of what happened to Jesus. His skin was literally in ribbons. The flesh and the muscle had been ripped away from the bone. The, the, the medical association says that you could look through his ribs from the back and see his heart beating. That he would have had zero to very little flesh from his shoulders to the backs of his knees because of the severity of the beating. 
He was beaten 39 times by Roman law because 40 times would have been an execution. And they reserved his death for crucifixion rather than beating. They took this crown of thorns. You say, well, is this exact one? No. But this comes from the town of Jerusalem. This is a thorn bush from that region. I've been there a couple of times. I can tell you they have these things here. This is what they put on Jesus' head to crown him king of the Jews as a mockery. And I'm going to leave it up here on the table after service, and you can kind of come up. And, and what I encourage you to do is just put it on your head <laughs> and get a feel for what your Savior experienced. There is no way, if the swoon theory were correct, Number one, there's no way that three days of rest would have recuperated him to a point where he could have moved the stone away, took the 100 pounds of grave clothes and, and preparation stuff away from himself, and walked out of that tomb. It's ridiculous to use that argument, but yet that is the one that science offers more often than any of the rest of them. But there are other evidences other than the illogical way that science has looked at this. The sheer discouragement of his followers tells us that Jesus most assuredly died on the cross. There's no argument about that. But something happened that changed this group, this small band of followers, from incredible doubters and discouraged individuals to people of faith. And, and most of us Pentecostals, we want to go, yeah, the, the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. No, it happened before then. It happened before then. I mean, they all, went, they all went fishing. They went into hiding. They did all of these kind of things. They were transformed from doubters who lacked the courage to identify with Jesus, especially in the Garden of Gethsemane, to individuals who boldly declared his death and his resurrection. What happened? What would have, what would have caused that? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 says this, I pass on to you what was most important and what was also passed on to me. This is Paul writing. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said. He was buried and he was raised again from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said. He was seen by Peter. He was seen by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him myself. Over the 40 days pre after post-resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus appeared 12 different times to people. I just want you to see these things this morning. In John 20, he appeared to Mary Magdalene. In Matthew 28, he appeared not only to Mary Magdalene, but to some of the ladies that were with him. They saw Jesus that day, and what they actually did when they saw him there, they grabbed his feet, fell down, his, grabbed his feet, and began to worship him. And they heard him speak to them, and they saw the empty tomb. The third account is Peter. Peter runs, he runs in there, 1 Corinthians 50. He saw and heard Jesus. He saw the empty tomb. He saw the grave clothes. In Mark 16 and in Luke 24, there were, there were men on the road to Emmaus that all of a sudden this stranger came and began to have a conversation with them. And they said, man, our hearts, are they burn within us. And we were talking and he was sharing things with us. And all of a sudden it wasn't until they were sitting down to a meal that Jesus began to break bread that their eyes, and they realized this is Jesus. They actually had a conversation with him after his resurrection. In Luke 24, he appeared to 10 of the disciples. They not only heard him, they touched him, they saw him eating fish, which, by the way, proves he had a physical, material nature and it was a resurrected body, not just some spiritual body. A spiritual body doesn't need fish. But he's eating fish, so he had a physical resurrection. It wasn't a ghost, as some have said, because ghosts don't eat. You say, how do you know, Phil? I just know. It's just one of them things, I just know. The sixth appearance was to 11 of the disciples, and this time Thomas was with them. Remember, the, remember they had come back and they said, oh, we've seen him. And Thomas said, look, I, I, I don't believe it. I doubt it. I won't believe it until I can put my finger in the nail print in his hands and stick my hand in the, in the spear in his side. If I can do that, then I'll believe it. Well, when Jesus appeared again, all of them were there. 
all 11. And this time he was allowed, and Jesus said, Thomas, come put your finger in the nail print in my hand. Come put your hand in the spear wound in my side. And Thomas did, and he said, my Lord and my God. But he saw him. The seventh appearance, there were seven of the disciples fishing on the Sea of Galilee in John 21. They saw him. They heard him. They ate breakfast with him. It was at this account that he actually restored Peter. Asking Peter three questions. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And every time he would ask that question, Peter would get more angry. But in that moment, God takes the time. Jesus Christ takes the time to restore Peter, not just to right relationship with him, but to ministry fulfillment. And he commissioned him to, to take the gospel of Jesus Christ. In John 21, again, we see him appearing again to the disciples on the Sea of Tiberias. In Matthew 28, he appeared and commissioned the apostles. In 1 Corinthians 15, the tenth appearance that we see in Scripture is that he appeared to more than 500 people at the same time. Talking about an eyewitness account. I mean, you might be able to discount a few ladies at the tomb. And you might be able to discount a disciple or two here and there, and even a couple of accounts by the disciple, because after, after all, they were the inner circle. But 500 people that were eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus Christ was not in the tomb any longer, but he was alive and he was walking around and he was having conversations and having food and having meals and things like this. This was what was going on. Paul wrote about that. We read it in our text. He wrote about this, and it only happened about 20 years after the resurrection. And there were still many, many, many of that 500 people that were still alive. And even Paul challenged the readers of the Corinthians. He said, look, I challenge you. Go check this out. You will find what I'm telling you to be true. I dare you to contradict this account. He appeared to his brother James. Now, James, one of the brothers of Jesus Christ, was not a believer when Jesus was walking on the earth. He didn't believe that his brother could be the Messiah. I know you. You think you're the Messiah? I know you. Think about this. you got a brother or sister? They come to you, hey, I'm the Messiah. What would you do? <laughs> Just like any other sibling. I don't think so. But after the resurrection... James becomes a believer. He actually leads the church in Jerusalem. It's a powerful, powerful testimony for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then the last account is to Paul. Now, a lot of people have said that, that Paul didn't see him. We, we, we read the account and we think it's just a light, but it's not. It's actually, actually, Paul sees Jesus. He tells us he does. He had a physical encounter with Jesus Christ. A dozen eyewitness accounts to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you know that there's more historical re evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ than there is for the theory of evolution? Have you ever met someone, have you, or have you ever met someone that saw a monkey turn into a human? I'm just asking a question this morning. Has there ever been anyone that can say unequivocally that they have watched the theory of evolution come into play and watch it unfold in front of their very eyes? The answer is no. That's why it's called a theory. You see, the, the swoon concept is a theory. But in fact, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a truth. It's a truth. You can take every other historical, every every other historical event that's taken place throughout all of history, and if you have more than two or three eyewitness accounts, then it becomes a fact. We have twelve that total close to six hundred individuals that actually visibly saw Jesus Christ alive after he was raised from the dead. But yet Humanity denies that it took place. 
at the end of the day, the one thing that sets Christianity apart from everything else in the world is the reality of the resurrection. We've seen all the eyewitness accounts. And here's the, here's the thing about eyewitness accounts. I don't know who said this. I'm, I, I said I didn't, but I'm going to repeat it. And that is this. I would rather have an experience than an argument any day of the week. And whether you think the disciples stole the body or the swoon theory or anything, that's just an argument. But almost 600 people saw him alive. They had the experience of seeing the resurrected Lord. It is more documented on paper in the writings of this book to various groups of individuals all over that region than any other single event in the history of the ancient world. You can go to the tomb of any religious leader. Take your pick. You can go to the tomb of any religious leader from any religion in this world throughout history. And if you go to that tomb, they're still in there. Whether it's Muhammad, whether it's Confucius, whoever it may be. But when you go to the tomb of Jesus Christ, the only thing that was left in that tomb were the grave clothes. Because he's not there. He's alive. Jesus Christ is alive today. He's alive this morning. And here's the thing. Here's what we have to understand. If he didn't resurrect from the dead, then our faith is useless. We're still in our sins and all these kind of things. But the hope of this day is this. It's found in three little words. But in fact. But in fact, Jesus Christ did and has been raised from the dead. And he's the first of the harvest of all. Listen to me this morning. When they went to that tomb and the angel was sitting there and they began, he said, they said, he, he said a very important question. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has been risen from the dead. Now, why is that so important to us today? Well, it's important for the fact that, that you and I can't come to faith in Jesus Christ without a belief in the resurrection. Now, I want you to look at this next passage of Scripture. This is the closing passage today. If I can get it done in 60 seconds, you're going to be out of here by 11 o'clock. I doubt I'll get there. Look at Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, what? That God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. That's how you come to faith. Oh, if you just believe in Jesus Christ. No. Many people have believed in Jesus Christ. There's no argument that Jesus Christ didn't live. He was alive. History tells us he was alive. History tells us that he had great moral teachings. But you have to, you have to believe in your heart that he is Lord. And you've got to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. If you declare that he is the Lord of your life and you believe that God raised him from the dead, then you come into a, a faith relationship with him. Nothing else matters. Nothing else gets you there. Oh, well, I believe I can get there through enlightenment. I believe I can get there through education. I believe I can get there through meditation. Look, I'm telling you this morning, to everyone in this room, everyone in overflow, and everybody's going to watch this podcast going forward from this week, I'm telling you today, there is only one way to get to God. There's only one way to get to heaven, and that is literally that you openly declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, and you believe in your heart that he was dead, but he's alive this morning. That's it. There's no other way. There's no other way. I want to ask the worship team to come back. I want you to stand all over this building here this morning, and here's what we're going to do. we got a full house here. we got a full house next door over there. But I want to simply ask you this question this morning. Is Jesus Christ, have you declared Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life? Do you believe that he was dead and he's alive again. 
then if that is the case, I'm not speaking on my authority, but I'm speaking on the authority of this book, that you are a born-again Christian. Your sins have been washed away. All of your sin, the sin of your past, the sin of your present, and any sin you may commit in the future, they've all been washed away. They've been placed under the blood of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is not dead. But in fact, it doesn't matter what history tells us. It doesn't matter what science tells us. What really matters more than anything else is what fact tells us. And fact is this, that Jesus Christ was dead and is now alive. Amen?